Now we could look at other structures of circuits. We could use a positive amplifier, and then we would need a, a passive circuit in here that could, at one frequency, have a phase shift of zero because this has a positive gain to it. Turns out this circuit has this property that at one frequency, the phase angle passes through zero. Let's figure out what conditions of oscillation would produce gain and a frequency so that we could then calculate this or design for it. Put an equivalent circuit for the non-inverting amplifier. If you recall, that's just a voltage gain of 1 plus the resistor ratio. And let's just make this resistor n times this one. Now our gain is n plus 1. And let's call this impedance Z1 and this impedance Z2. We could also use the determinant idea we just did, but I thought maybe I'll show you another technique. And that is just to go around the loops here. The voltage V here is coming back around and getting amplified by a factor of n plus 1. So we could take the voltage here, which is n plus 1 times V, and calculate the voltage V here with a voltage divider of Z2 over Z1 plus Z2. So we got V on both sides of the equation. Now, if it's an oscillator, the voltage would not be 0, and we could divide through by the value of V. That would imply that this quantity right here is equal to 1. Cross multiply here and get Z plus 1 over Z plus 2, which is Z1 over Z2 plus 1. And then the 1s can cancel, and that says that N has to equal Z1 divided by Z2 at the frequency of oscillation. This is going to give us, again, a gain and a frequency. Because two things are in parallel here, let me write Z2 as the reciprocal of Y2. So Z1 is a series combination of R1 and C1. And Y2 is the parallel combination of R2 and C2. So it's the sum of their admittances. Again, that has to equal N. All right, if I multiply this out, I'll get a real and imaginary term. So I get this times this, which is R1 over R2. Watch, I'm going to do this one over here first, of J omega C2 R1. And then I've got this inner product, which is minus J omega C1, and then 1 over R2. And then lastly, the product of these two gives me uh, C2 over C1. The omegas cancel, and I get a J squared, which cancels the minus sign. This has to equal N, but really it's, it's N plus J0. It's a complex number equaling a complex number in rectangular form. Now, if you look at the real parts here, it's, it's R1 over R2 and C2 over C1, and that would have to equal N. The imaginary terms would be omega C2 R1, and put this on the other side of the equation, would be a plus omega over C1 R2. So if we bring the C2 R1 over here and bring the omega over here, we get that omega squared is 1 over R1 R2 C1 C2. So taking the square root of that and then dividing by 2 pi, that would be my frequency of oscillation. A lot of times it's easy to set resistors equal, makes it simpler in terms of ordering parts. So let's just make the two resistors and two capacitors equal. That's going to give me a value of n equal to 2. And this well, becomes r1 squared and c1 squared, and so just r1, c1. Since we have a non-inverting amplifier, we'll have a gain of 3 needed to make an oscillator. And it'll oscillate at this frequency once we set up that gain of 3. In the lab, we're going to vary a resistor to watch the oscillation be initiated in a sine wave will pop up right on your oscilloscope screen. When you build a phase shift oscillator, you'll notice that it's very tricky to get the oscillator to oscillate when you vary your resistance to get exactly the gain of minus 29. Some people describe it as trying to balancing a bowling ball at the end of a broomstick. Trying to control this exact point where it goes into a sine wave is very difficult. And what uh, William Hewlett had figured out when doing actually his master's thesis is that if you put in some kind of a feedback regulator that he could adjust this automatically. And he wind up making an oscillator, which he sold to Walt Disney for some of the early audio tests in talking films. Let me show you how the idea works. We have an amplifier here. And in lab, we're going to be varying this resistor to try to create an oscillation. And as you'll see, it's very difficult to adjust. But if we replace this resistor by a light bulb, we could use some of the properties of cold and hot resistance to act as a regulator. When you first turn the power on, the resistance of this bulb is its cold resistance, which is its lowest value. And so what that's going to do is make this amplifier have its largest gain. And that's going to get the oscillations to start, in fact, be overdriven. This will create a distorted sine wave. But as the voltages peer across this bulb, it begins to heat up. And the resistance begins to increase. And so the gain of the amplifier begins to drop because, again, it's the ratio of these two resistors divided by this one. And the oscillation, if the gain is too low, begins to die. 
And so you'll see the oscillations kind of falling off when you're doing it by hand and adjusting this. But as that oscillation is dying, the bulb cools off again and it restarts itself. And you can adjust the pot here till you find exactly the right point where it'll regulate itself and just keep give you a nice constant oscillation. This is what Hewlett had figured out as a way to make a practical oscillator that could be tunable and still be very stable without someone having to adjust gain factor for each case. What's interesting though is this bulb does not get hot enough to actually light up. Kind of funny story, when I built my first oscillator when I was in school early college, I noticed there was a light bulb inside of it and I was totally perplexed as to why would you put a bulb inside of a box when you can't see it. So only years later I realized that the bulb doesn't light up but is acting as a nonlinear resistor with temperature that acts as a stabilizer. You can also tap the bulb and change its resistance. It becomes kind of a motion detector too. Let me play with that in lab. As you saw in, in 203 lab, the non-ideal capacitor does play a role in some filter circuits and what this RC circuit is doing is a type of a filtering. And so again, we're going to see the effects of dissipation factor in our results in lab. If you had an ideal capacitor, the angle between voltage and current would be 90 degrees. For a non-ideal capacitor, it's a little bit less than 90 degrees. And manufacturers describe a dissipation factor in terms of the tangent of 90 degrees minus this angle. So ideally, if this was 90 degrees, then the dissipation factor would be zero. The dissipation factor can be thought of really as just that, a resistor effectively in series with the capacitance. So our non-ideal capacitor looks like an ideal capacitor in a resistance. If you were to write this as an admittance, where I've got this series combination of impedance, then the admittance is the reciprocal of the impedance. And that would give me, if I multiply through by j omega c sub s, this expression. And so this has a magnitude and angle, magnitude of omega c sub s and an angle of 90. And then the magnitude here is the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. And then the angle is the arc tangent of the imaginary over the real. The angle of y of s, this is our model for the capacitor, would be the angle of the numerator minus the angle of the denominator. If we bring the phi on this side and the tangent onto this side, and then take the arc tangent of both sides, we get the definition of dissipation factor, and it turns out to be equal to omega c sub s r sub s. So this is measured at a frequency and has a value, and is fairly constant for low frequencies, but it will actually vary with frequency. We'll look at this problem in this course and in future courses too, because it's a big effect, especially at RF frequencies. We call this the effective series resistance of the capacitor at a given frequency for a given value of C sub s. We're going to use this to do some spice simulation and compare our lab results with our simulation results. When you test audio amplifiers, you need to have really pure sine waves as inputs. Our sine wave generator in lab is actually a shape network and is pretty low in distortion, but the circuits that we're just looking at are called harmonic oscillators and they actually produce perfect sine waves. And so you can make ultra low distortion sine waves with this particular technique. Our function generator in lab is much more flexible, let's go up over a much larger range of values. Still, there is some distortion in the sine wave. And so this is one way to making a very pure sinusoidal source. The concepts that we covered were modeling the inverting and non-inverting amplifier, conditions for oscillations, a phase shift and a wean bridge oscillator, and the idea of automatic gain control for oscillator stabilization. Reviewing the techniques of, of dissipation factor measurement using an LCR meter. And then we're going to learn how to measure phase shift using the dual trace feature of the oscilloscope. And this is Lab 7, a low distortion sinusoidal oscillator for use in audio test equipment.